Thank you very much, Penny. I'm always very happy to have an excuse to come back to Southampton and to feel so welcomed, and obviously I feel at home here, too. So planning for college today, which is what we're supposed to be talking about, is, I think, a far more complicated process than it ever used to be. I, tonight, would like to try to de-stress you all rather than add to the stress, because I think there is enough stress as there is. But I know that the students here, and I'm trying to grab on how many students there might be, when I say the word planning, they probably are thinking in their head, yeah, I'm planning to get out of here about as quick as I can. <laughs> and I'm planning to get back to my IME or my Facebook or whatever else it is that I would much rather be doing than what I'm doing now, being forced to sit here. And that's pretty normal for a 16 or 17 year old. They, you know, they're pretty happy. Why are you going to kick me out of the house? What do you think I'm going to get out of this? At any rate, I think obviously tonight I can't start the discussion of college search and the whole planning process without mentioning the very large elephant in the room. And that elephant obviously is the economy and the effect that it has had this year on admissions and the effect that it definitely will have next year on admissions uh, and, and as a matter of fact on the entire college process. Uh, I could speak for three hours on that alone. I could just, I want to show you. I mean, I have to read every day, but these are just the New York Times for the last three weeks, maybe. State colleges face cuts in ambitions. Well-regarded public colleges get a surge of bargain hunters. Private colleges worry about a dip in enrollment. Colleges sweat out admissions this year. To keep students, colleges cut anything but aid. Yale will fire up to 300 staff. Big changes in, on the way in lending to students. In tough times, the humanities must justify their worth. And this is from the Chronicle of Higher Education. A march from madness, which I love because we are now in March Madness. But it obviously talks about the uncontrolled spending that there has been on athletics in the colleges over the past 15 years. And a lot of those chickens have come home to roost because they built facilities based on they could bring in. And they're not bringing it in, no more than anybody else is. Cornell, expects, uh, Cornell experts discuss colleges' responsibilities during hard times. That's just a sampling. And then there are all of these that I got from the Chronicle. So I, I sort of wish that we had two <clears throat> hours, but I know the kids don't, so I will get back to business on that. But it is going to have a huge impact. I subscribe to College Bound. You can all get the times, but here's College Bound, February 2009. Economic turmoil impacts 2009 admissions. Public universities brace for application surge. Facebook as an admissions tool, which by the way, I'll just throw in here now. All of you who are on Facebook, make sure it's cleaned up. I don't know of a college in the country that doesn't have one staff member dedicated to, guess what? Guess what? Facebook. Facebook. Colleges dig deeper into wait lists. Yeah, I threw in my Facebook thing. I have a 16-year-old granddaughter. I'm always on her about Facebook. She says, would you just drop it? I get it. So I understand you get it, but make sure you get it because they do look. It's not that they look to get you in. They're looking because, bye-bye. There's nothing that they really see on there that makes them attracted to you. But there are some things they see on there that make them say, oh, no, not on my campus. That's not going to happen. At any rate, to talk to the students here, you guys, how many students? Raise your hand just so I know what I'm talking to. Oh, you poor ones. There's only like five of you, six of you, seven. OK. Guess what? You're going to have about five or six different careers. Not a job. I didn't say five or six jobs. I said five or six careers. More than 80% of those have not even been born yet, meaning we don't even know what to call them. So how are we supposed to tell you what to go study? And the answer to that is we can't tell you what to go study. As we have all learned, there are really no expert prognosticators on the job market. But I think we can agree that there likely will be jobs in healthcare because 
population's getting older and everybody gets sick at one time or another. Uh, there will be jobs in education because the demographics do not show a tremendous drop in the school-aged children, especially in math and science with the new initiatives that the new president has put forth. If they get implemented, there will be hiring in education in the math and science fields and in elementary, especially in the special ed fields. Um, they also say that the eco-technology fields obviously will grow as well as a few selective engineering fields. And then I read an article in Newsday this week. Here is a guaranteed job for you. Anybody know what it is? There are two things that are certain in life, death and taxes. So be an accountant, do the taxes, or, as Newsday says, mortuary science. Nassau Community College can't handle the number of applicants this year. This is Newsday last week. Because everybody's going to die, and they need people. All right? So I think I could bring this home to you and to the parents by pointing out, four years ago, students who graduated with a degree in finance were getting 80, 90, $100,000 signing bonuses. So a lot of bright kids started college four years ago as finance majors. Now where are those poor kids going to be? Look what they're coming out into used to be able that colleges would have to limit the number of prospective employers that came onto the campus to do hiring. This year, those colleges can't get them to come on campus. So that's what happens in four years. And my point is only not to, you know, to beat a dead horse, but to simply say, that if you are too narrowly focused, you may not be doing yourself a service. Um, so I, I would encourage you to think that you can't pick solely on what you think is going to be a financial guarantee, unless you want to go to mortuary science. All right, so as we undertake this planning process for college, one of the first questions I have to ask the students is, why are you going to college? Now, that's a critical first step, but it's a step that most kids don't take to heart. And if you can't come up with a reason other than, I don't like it here, or it's too cold, I want to go somewhere south, or, you know what, this town is, I'm not going to use your word, but I got to go someplace where there's some action. So, all right, I hate high school, I can't stand anymore, I don't like those teachers, I'm never the same kids, blah, blah, you know, a whole bit. You cannot choose to go to college simply because it's the next step that you think you're supposed to take because guess what, it's not going to work. So you have to think, why am I going to go to college? You have to have a willingness, students, to understand that going to college means being a student. And if you hate being a student, there's not much sense in this, okay? And it's the last thing I get kids to deal with. I mean, I have dealing with kids for, take a guess, but they, will, they are wonderful at ignoring what has to be addressed. And what has to be addressed is why are you going? If you hate being a student, then do not put yourself through it, simply because you don't like where you are, all right? You have to be a full-time, honest to goodness, real working student. Now. When I say that, I don't think I have to force you to choose a major, because I already said, I, I don't feel that we should choose, make a 16 or 17 year old choose a major necessarily, or choose a career. So what I say then in this planning process, don't choose a college solely because it has a particular academic discipline. Resist the temptation to say, I'm going to college because I want to get away from whatever it is. Now, if you're a lucky one of the seven kids sitting here, and you say to me, yeah, but I've always wanted to be a vet. Then guess what? I know you've already done something that shows the admissions people and me, or you, that you really do want to be a vet. You volunteered at a vet place. You've shadowed a vet. You have animals. That lets me know you really do know, have some idea what it is you want to do. If you're a lucky one and that's the case, then God bless you and follow it, okay? On the other hand, Fashion seems to be the major of the moment for all the females. 
If I had a dollar for every young woman that comes into me and says, I want a job in the fashion industry, I wouldn't be here tonight because I wouldn't need to be here. The point is, I say to them all, we're all, you're all, it's part of the age to be part involved with the fashion industry. You love fashion, I understand that. Television shows, everything else is all fashion. When you read things like the Wall Street Journal and you listen carefully to the fashion people, you know that the industry is dying. There's no jobs in the fashion industry right now. Who's buying in the first place? In the second place, there are tons of people who want a job in this industry. So I have had to say to any numbers of young women, if you want a job in that industry, do not limit yourself by going to college to be a fashion merchandising major. <coughs> Get yourself a major that you can then put into the fashion industry. I hope you all see the difference. I'm not not in the fashion industry, but I'm saying to you, you're 16 or 17, don't limit yourself now. All right. So, with that said, you must find your passion. All right, you say to me, my passion is fashion. Okay, then take that passion and enlarge upon it. Anybody want to discuss that with me? I mean, do you know where I'm going with this? Talk to people who are designers. Talk to the merchandisers. Go to New York and walk around. Look at the fashion show that they had, I don't know, what, how long ago was it? A month ago or something? There weren't enough buyers there. They just put it on because they felt they had to put on the show. Now I'm just knocking, I'm not knocking that industry because that's pretty typical of a lot of things that are happening. My point is don't narrow your focus too early. All right, career counselors that I've talked to, and I go to a ton of these career meetings, they say that today's graduates, now listen, will have to be computer literate no matter what field you enter. You have to be able to read. Okay, don't laugh. Here's the U.S. News and World Report. Barely half of students are ready for college reading. Now, this is disgusting. Only 51% of the 2.1 million students who took the ACT last year were judged to be capable of college-level reading. All right, so that proves that point. <laughs> you better learn to read somewhere along the way. Um, they have to be able to communicate effectively they have to be flexible, they have to be problem solvers, a thinker and a doer. They must be able to analyze and to think critically, and they must be able to learn quickly and wear several hats at one time. What that translates into is getting yourself the broadest base education that you can get. And I happen to read today, you say, what do you do, nothing but read? But this is from the Chronicle of Higher Education. The title is, Economics is the Just Right Liberal Arts Major. This is written by the Chief of the Economics Department at Middlebury College. Anybody here know Middlebury College? Nobody? Okay. It's a very good school. I will read you. Please listen, especially students. Companies like to hire economics majors from liberal arts colleges, not because the students have been trained in business, but because they have a solid background in the liberal arts. What I hear from business people is that they don't care what a job candidate has majored in. They want students who can think, communicate orally, write and solve problems, and who are comfortable with quantitative analysis. They do not expect colleges to provide students with specific training in business skills. Now, it sort of mimics what I just said to you, what I hear at the career counselors. But I think it's an important point for you as students to understand that you want to be able to be flexible so you get a broad-based education. Uh, the report states that narrow preparation in a single area, whether that field is chemistry or information technology or history, is exactly the opposite of what graduates need from college. Don't limit yourself early on. That's the thrust of that. All right, so getting off on the right foot, the first step for the students 
is to take a careful self-inventory. Now, the students I work with, I have them fill out what they call a bunch of dumb forms. The questions I ask them to answer for me make sense to me because what I hone in on is what they feel passionate about, how they learn best. Here's a telling thing for you. If you have a student, I'll address to the parents and students. If you're a kid and you get on really well with a particular teacher, you actually like the teacher as a human being. God forbid, but you do. You know, you have a little repertoire going on with the teacher, high in the hall. A teacher knows you by name, gives you a little punch, jostles you, has a nickname for you. And you do well in that class because you have that rapport with the teacher. How are you, as that type of learner, going to learn in an auditorium where there are six or seven hundred kids and you're known by a number? You may not learn as well. Now, there are some kids who don't want the teacher to know their name, who, could, who just could care less, who basically tune out in any given classroom and do the work on their own. They don't, they don't want anybody to mess with them. All right, they will like that 600 seat, 1,000 seat auditorium. There is one school, name unsaid. This came to me last year. I thought I knew everything in the world about college admissions, having been in this field for 40 years. I was on a tour, and I saw a big amphitheater. And the tour guide said, somebody asked, well, you know, what's your average class? And she said, oh, about 25. So I, being me, I said, well, who sits in that auditorium we just saw? Oh, well, we use that for, you know, some classes. But I noticed on the seats in that auditorium a little keypad on the top of the desk. And I know a kid who goes to that college. So I said, you know, I just saw that key, what, what's that keypad for? Oh, that's our attendance taker. You have a code number. You put your code number in. That's how they take attendance. Now, smart kids obviously figure out that as the professor is looking into the auditorium, he has you know, limits. I can see that corner. I can see that corner. So what you do is give your number to the guy next to you. You all trade off. No way I'm spending $50,000 a year for that education. I'm telling you that. Because it's just key function. That's all it is. At any rate, that's a little off the side. Uh, so the learning, the way you learn best is something that you have to consider. And then I asked them what have been the major influences in their life, um, you know, what their dreams are for the future. And if I have a kid who doesn't fill in what their dreams are for the future, I really feel sad because at 17 you should have dreams. If you don't have them at 17, you're not likely to get them. So let's encourage you as parents, encourage the kids to dream. All right, so what does this all mean in practical terms for you? Okay. Um, you know the media is all into this sort of superficial, I call, rankings. I'm not a big fan of U.S. News and World Report. I think it does a huge disservice to college admissions. I think it does a huge disservice to the students. And they only focus on about 8 to 10% of the 3,500 colleges in this country anyway. So the atmosphere gets very supercharged. And now we have the added mystery of what is the financial aid situation going to be. The first thing I would say to you, there are massive cutbacks at both the public and the private colleges. You have shrinking endowments, even at the wealthiest schools. Harvard has gone from 35 billion to 26 or 27 billion. Now I'm not gonna cry for Harvard because they lost eight or 10 or 15 billion dollars. But that will have an effect, and it does have a sort of a trickle down effect. Uh, financial aid now has taken on a total new meaning. All I will say to the parents is, do not go by sticker price. Remember one of the headlines I showed you from the New York Times, colleges cutting everything but aid? I don't know if you remember a while ago, there was a uh, guy on TV who sold trucks in Chicago, I believe it was, somewhere in Illinois, who said, buy one, get one free, and he cleared his lot, and people would say, why did he do that? Well, I know why he did it from an admission standpoint, because he broke even. He was treading water, and that's what your colleges are going to have to do for a while, for a couple of years. So there's been massive sort of discounting that as I've seen going on this year, 
some of it I saw last year, but this year. Now, you say, well, does that mean everybody gets a discount? No, it doesn't. The biggest discounts, unfortunately, go to the kids with the highest scores. Why? So that the statistics for the given college will then go up in U.S. News and World Report. So while they're treading water, they're pushing up their stats in that wonderful magazine. On the other hand, there is this point too. If you fall into the category where you're not going to be able to get need-based aid, there's a difference between merit-based and need-based. All right, Merit-based is based on how high your scores are, what your class rank is, and perhaps some extraordinary talent that you might have. Need-based is based on the numbers that you give when you fill out the FAFSA and the profile. There are two different kinds of forms. FAFSA is the federal form. The profile is the form that very selective, well, not all of them are very selective, that private colleges use to give you college money. All right, so the point will be that Let's say you fit into the category maybe your expected contribution on a $50,000 school is supposed to be 20. That you're supposed to, all right, so you say, well, that would be nice. You better give me a $30,000 package. If it's a 100% need school, they will give you a $30,000 package. But not all schools are that way. Some schools will say, well, you know, you give me your 20, you hang for the rest, do what you want. If you can come up for 50, we'd love to have you here. If you can't, don't. Now, there are some schools who are going to say to you, okay, guess what? We're going to give you the 30, even though you don't really deserve it, because this way you may, and this is only for the really good kids, you're going to make some money down the road, and guess what you're going to do? You're going to give money back here, you're going to contribute. Then we'll take another picture. Let's say your need is zero. You're supposed to be able to pay 50, and you say, what? I don't got 50,000 to give you. That's what the form shows. Those are what the numbers show. So they say, all right, I'll tell you what. I'll give you 20, and you'll give me 30. Guess what? I come out 10 ahead. So they do it. And I've seen schools this year giving out $25,000 to people who basically on paper don't show need. So obviously they're grabbing on to those schools. And those schools are doing what I call this sort of thing like the Chevy dealer did. I'm keeping, I'm treading water and I'm keeping my head above. All right. But anyway, that's just part of what goes into this whole thing this year. Then we throw into you all the different kinds of testing and we have wonderful Westland College Board who's throwing us now score choice this year for the first time. We have early decision, we have early action. We've got single choice for early action. We have rolling. We have every kind of different admissions picture that you can pick up on. Then we have, should the kids send a resume, an extracurricular resume? Should the student send a portfolio? Suppose the student is very good in art. Suppose a student is very good in acting. Suppose a student is a very good athlete. Colleges will want what I call some kind of a special talent profile. You can put a disc together. Athletes do this all the time. Coaches will say, all right, good, send me a tape. So the athlete gets a tape put up, sends it to the coaches. But we don't pay as much attention as we should to the colleges that say, if you have an extra talent in art, not necessarily that you're going to be an art major, but let, a, a school like Vassar will be one that says, you don't have to be an art major, but we'd like to keep our art department flourishing. Send us a portfolio, send us a disc, send us some drawings. All right, a person who's, who's an actor, or someone who's a singer, musician, certain schools will allow you to send in a disc or whatever it is that you want to present as a special talent profile. If you are a special talent profile, you all know, I think, that athletes go into a separate admissions pile. Do you all know that? You should. Athletes, especially, if you are a Division I or Division II athlete and you have good grades and good scores, you can almost write your ticket. Because you don't get into the 
I'll take BU, 38,000 applicants, NYU, 38,000 applicants. You don't get into that 38,000 pool. You get into the athlete pool. That's a much smaller pool. So what you want to do, pool what I mean, not what we're going to go swimming, but it's the pool of applicants, okay? So you want to make sure that they know what your special talent is because every school has an orchestra, if you're that. They have an art department. They have every kind of club that goes so that if you've been very productive in something, let the college know it. If you have a special talent, don't hide that light under a bushel. All right, so the students that I do, after I take them through a self-inventory, I, I, like I, I like to say to them, I'm a, very, I'm, a, I'm a sneaker salesman, and I want to find a sneaker that fits you. So I give them a sneaker shelf, and I say, on that shelf, there are sneakers that fit you. And we have to say, what do we mean by fit? Well, by fit, I mean academic, social, financial, geographic. You don't have any kids out here, by the way, who say, I can't live if I can't go surfing. So I have to find a school on the water, or somewhere near the water, all right? Now, I will warn you, students, there is no perfect fit. You will have to make trade-offs. There is no perfect college. So I warn you, don't fall into this love at first sight. Oh, I'm in love with this place. I'm going to go here. Because you may not go there, and it may not be the best fit. We have to look at all, all the fits. And I am a firm believer that if it doesn't fit, it will not work. So how do you go about this? You start, if you possibly can, by window shopping. And that's all I mean is window shop. You visit. You get out of the car and you walk around. And when you go on any college trips, the first thing you do is go into the admissions office and sign in. Why? Because you are showing interest. There is this word, demonstrated interest. Does it come into effect? You bet it comes into effect. It comes into play. Does it come into a play of a school that's got 38,000 applicants? No. Does a school come into a, effect at a school, I'm going to use Penny, like Bates or Bowden? Absolutely it comes into play. So you have to show a little bit of demonstrated interest by getting out of the car, going into the admissions office, and you have to understand that you, you are there now just sort of to window shop here. And again, don't just, as the kids would say, don't just go with this idea of, I'm going to go any place that's warm. The weather might fit you, but the people, maybe somebody, that you just can't stand. So why do you go where it's warm if you can't stand the people? You have to have your head screwed on straight when you're doing this. The looks of a college or a location may be what attract you initially, but guess who's going to keep you there? People are going to keep you there. You're going to run into a problem, kids. Every student runs into a problem. When you get up in the morning after you've had this huge problem, and you look out the window and you say, oh, that's a beautiful tree, that's a beautiful building, I think I'll stay. That doesn't happen. But if you think, you know, I really like it, I like the people, the people are nice, I feel comfortable, I don't feel like I'm a fish out of water, you'll find a way to solve the problem. But if it's only the location and only the looks, you're not going to solve the problem. So the next stage after we go window shopping is to buy, meaning we're going to buy some sneakers. Now, if you're going to be smart about spending your money, you don't want to end up with seven identical pair of Adidas, because that's a dumb way to spend your money. But there will be a common factor in those sneakers. So how do you come about to know which ones am I supposed to buy? You've got to be smart. You have to be a wise consumer. And you have to be proactive. That means you've got to start doing the work now about learning about it. And what I would say, and I warn the parents, if there's anybody here who's had a senior already, you know what I'm about to say. There's huge changes that take place between this time junior year and this time senior year. I always love to say that at this time, Hawaii is not far enough away, but a year from now, Suffolk may be looking really nice. At the beginning, I'm out of here is all that the kids want to say. But when push comes to shove and we got to put our money down, I was only kidding about Hawaii, and I don't really think that's where I want to be. And then the other thing we have to say is that students today, 
I don't know picking on you guys, really. You know, you're a tough group. You're a tough group to please. Let's think of it. I'll, I'll, I'll pick on the guys, all right? You're a 16 to 17 year old male. You've got your own room. You got three square meals a day. You got clean clothes. You have a phone. You know, you all have phones and whatever, those things you carry around all the time with you. You got friends. You have a car. You have good use of a car. And they're telling you you have to leave it. They're telling you you have to get out of the house and share a room and have a communal bathroom and be stuck with whatever they feed you. And you're saying, uh uh, no, I don't want that. And the other thing is, you all want constant motion. That's, you just want motion. You want excitement. You want things happening. You want something to do. Every student, I'll say to you, why do you want that particular? Well, I want something to do. But you're going to be a student. You don't have time to do something to do. When I explain the old rule of for every hour you're in class, you're supposed to theoretically spend three hours outside of class studying for that class. And then, of course, you have to do your YouTubing and your everything else. And you have to eat. And some of you will be you know, doing photography. Some will be acting. Some will be singing. Some will be drawing. Some will be playing a sport. When do you, and you have to sleep. When do you think you have time to go roam the streets? You don't really have time to go roaming the streets. So, but that's the, we, what we want. We want everything. And that's actually, if you want to get, the parents want this, why colleges over the past decade have spent massive amounts of money to appeal to the kids. We don't have gyms anymore. You've got facilities that are like a first class spa. You don't have a cafeteria anymore. You have an international food court at the very least. You have eight 10, 50, I've been on a college campus where there were 15 to 20 different places to eat, okay? And food, that is sophisticated food, you know, that this is international gourmet kind of food. Um, and so, and then technology, everything has to be wired, double wired. So the students want it all, guess who's paying for it? You're paying for it. And because colleges are a business, they constantly go through the updating because they don't want to offend their consumers. And that's one of the reasons why college costs have been rising at the rate that they've been going, because the money is sure not going to the faculty. That I can assure you. It doesn't go there. You have your adjuncts starting still at around 42, 44,000 with a PhD. That's more schooling than a lawyer or a doctor has. And that's where they're starting. So the students also want something close to heaven because we have all told them college is heaven. Now, so I'm asking you, be realistic, be flexible, be persistent in acquiring the facts. You get going, you start now. You work step by step. You don't start a month from now, two months from now, three months from now. You say, what can I do now? What you can do now is take yourself a self-inventory. What do I really like? What do I really, really like? You can set up a resume. Juniors I'm working with have already set up their resume because you can add to it. You keep adding to it, it's done. You don't have to do all this work then in the fall. And you work step by step. And then we are going to have to come to the question eventually. You have to get your voice known into this. What sneaker is gonna be most comfortable for you where will the sneaker fit you, but also give you room to grow, because that's part of the process. And for the kids who would never be caught dead wearing sneakers, and that's okay too, because, you know, then we look for a place where they wear sandals or whatever. We want to make sure you're going to be challenged and stimulated and be successful, because that's why we're going. So, my final word is do not choose a college based on what you don't like about high school because college is entirely different. Do not choose a location based upon what you don't like about where you live because you're going to be living in a, you're going to be doing something entirely different. So if you will take those sheets that I gave you, first thing I want to address with you is the testing scene. And that's what we have here. Now does anybody have any question about the testing? Um, First of all, with College Board, there's your website, and I would say to the parents, get on there now, do a profile registration. There, you can, you can actually do a financial aid estimator to give you some sense of where you are. How many kids here are juniors? Oh, only one. 
How many parents of juniors are here? All right, so the parents of juniors are going to want to do a financial aid estimator, and there's no need to wait. You can do that right on the college board uh, setting here. And for kids who even are not juniors, so get on there and do the question of the day anyway. You're doing your preparation for eventually for the SAT. Here's the testing sequence. Then the ACT, um, we originally had this scheduled so that you would have been able to have, have uh, registered for the ACT. I feel this way. People say, why do you push the ACT? I push the ACT because it's part of the arsenal that you can use. I'm not sure every guidance counselor agrees with me, but I know nationally that every college across the country is now seeing that the ACT is not simply a Midwestern test as it was 25 years ago. But even 25 years ago, I was making every kid at Mattatuck take the ACT because I said, why not? It's, part of, it's out there. It's an arsenal. You can use it. Um, is there any question about the testing? There are kids who are sophomores here who are in perhaps math B3, whatever we're calling it now. We're all switching. Um, you may want to think of taking math level one as your subject test. I've written this all down there. In terms of the SAT score choice, okay. Anybody heard about SAT score choice? No? Wow. Uh, okay. How, okay, what, what, grade are you, what, guy, what grade are you guys in? Sophomores. Anybody here in advanced math as a sophomore? Yeah. You're, so you're in? Math B. Math B. Yeah. All right. You, all right. You may want to think about taking math level one subject test this year. Anybody here in AP World as a sophomore? You definitely. If you're doing well in that, you definitely want to think about taking that. Definitely. All right. Uh, Anybody here as a junior? Who do I have any juniors? Junior. All right. Anybody in AP US? Okay. Take a take the uh, take the subject test. AP. No, the subject test in US. Subject test. See down here at the at the bottom where I put all this. I I suggest the following sequence, which can't do this now. April ACT with writing for all students. May SAT, June SAT subject test for those students applying to colleges requiring these exams. Seniors may repeat the SAT, ACT exams in the fall of senior year. IFI is limiting yourself to three SAT test dates. Suggestion, take Math 1C at the end of sequence 3 or Math B. This is a very broad survey test for students who have taken three years of college prep math. Math 2C is intended for students who have taken college prep math for more than three years. Take the SAT subject test at the end of the year in which you have a class preparation for a Regents exam or AP exam. I definitely think a kid who's in AP World is going to be equipped to take the subject test in World. But definitely a kid who's in AP US is equipped to take that subject test. Do you say, well, why do we need a subject test? Well, you may decide to apply to a college that requires subject tests. And you don't want to have to take it a year after you have finished the preparation for it. So you take it while you're finishing the course. All right, is that clear? So the AP exam is not enough. You still have to take Yes, the AP exam is simply for AP credit when one would go to college to see if the college will give you credit for that. The subject test is if a college requires that in addition to the SAT or ACT or both, they ask you for subject tests. And my big point in pressing it is the student is a senior. The student decides I want to apply to Georgetown, all right? And Georgetown requires three subject tests. What, you're not going to go back and study for the world because you had it two years ago. So you're limited. All right? Score choice. Ooh. Okay. For the first time this year, how, how many juniors am I talking to? Okay. 
Um, up until this point, whenever you took the SAT and you asked to have your test sent to a college, all of your scores went on that test report. Starting this year's testing sequence, you request only the tested date that you want college board to send to the colleges. So the score? Well, here's the kicker. Normally, statistically it's been proven that a kid will do well in one test date on the verbal and in another test date on the math. So colleges have all, the majority of colleges, not all, have said, we will do the student the best we can. We will take the highest math and the highest verbal, and we'll put them together. Now, you have to send then both test dates in order for the college to be able to do that. And there are then, I throw this at you, there are colleges who have now said, well, that's nice of College Board to have offered that, but we want to have all test scores reported to us, all test dates. So the kid says, well, how am I supposed to know? Well, when you get onto the College Board website and you ask to have your scores sent, they will show you which schools require that you send all. I mean, Pomona, Yale, Georgetown, and I, there are others, but those three jump right to my mind that say, you are applying here, we want all scores reported. All. So you don't get to pick which one you really want. So, you know, the sport choice is optional. I can't believe that the high school hasn't gone over this with you kids because it's really an important thing that you understand this. The sport choice is optional, and if you decide, if the student does not actively decide to use it, then all of his or her scores are going to be sent automatically. And then for students who are unsure of which scores to send, College Board recommends that they send all scores. But if, they, if, if, the, if the guidance counselors don't tell you about it, and therefore you don't opt for it, then score choice doesn't mean anything to you. So I don't know. I mean, I try to take the kids through that, um, through score choice. Get on College Board, parents read about the score choice options, okay? And remember that there will be colleges that will require all of your test scores. Another point that I want, that I have in italics there, is that college board is a monopoly and they make a good deal of money, but there are fee waivers that are available for the test. Do not be shy about asking your guidance counselors for those fee waivers, especially in these economic times. I mean, if you're going to take a test and of course $45, and then you've got to take it and you've got to have a score sent and it's $9 a piece, and then you have to take it again and again. I mean, we're talking a couple of hundred dollars before you turn around. So if you qualify, then you ask your guidance counselor for a fee waiver, which also entitles you to four free applications. Okay. So any questions about the um, testing? Yeah. I'm a little bit confused about that. Um, about the, uh, the score. Score choice. Score choice. Um, if a college requires all the tests and you pick score choice, you're only sending, let's say, two specific dates. And I know. What, and the other ones they don't get. Oh so, no, they're gonna. They they are putting the burden on the kids. They are saying if you have taken it three times, it is your burden to send all three to us. So if you pick score choice, then you have to send them. Uh, you have to take it upon yourself to make Absolutely. sure that they get the other information. Absolutely. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, my daughter just took the SAT last. Week. In March. Last week. Yes. And uh, we didn't know about the score choice. So did so. you have the score sent somewhere? When you filled out the registration, did you send the scores to four colleges? They give you four free schools to send it to. No, we didn't, we didn't select any, any schools. Okay, all right. You have to the 23rd to put that, but you didn't opt for score choice is what you're saying. Yeah, we didn't know about it. Don't go back to the 23rd? I would try the 23rd to put down the places where you want to send. Yeah, yeah. Any changes? yes. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, leave it to College Board to confuse it more than ever, but they have. And it will continue. Uh, my point with it is, 
Again, I think the wealthy are favored because you get the first test, you don't like the scores, you hire a private tutor, you keep taking, you keep paying the private tutor, take it four times, you finally get it up to 200 points, 200 points. What about the kids who can only take it once? That's where my heart has always been. That's why I put down here in black and white, I do not like kids to take it more than three times. I like them to take it once in May and once in October. That, I think, is the best. I often ask if I feel there's the financial ability to do it, to have the kids register for the November test in the fall at the same time that they register for the October test, because I like to tell the kids I see it as a safety net underneath you. And you get your scores back, and you feel we're all happy with that, then you just don't go into November. And I don't like kids feeling in October, everything rides on this one test date. So that's why I often encourage them just to put it as a safety net. Yeah. So do they take the test in their junior year? Yes. The yes. Some schools are promoting, because of sports release, the January testing for juniors and the March testing, and I don't go for it. I, myself, am old-fashioned, as you can tell. I like to have the May as the first because having taught, as well as having been a college counselor for many, many years, I know the degree of preparation that goes on in any school building between February and May or June for, guess what, Regents exams. And just that extra two months, three months of preparation, I think makes the kid a better test taker. That's why I like the sequence that I set up, yeah. I saw said that he said it wasn't a good idea to March because he feels like he still is not prepared so well. Absolutely. Have, you know, knowledge even. He said yeah. that he may will have. That's the point because I was upset about he missed the March. No, no, don't be upset about the fact that he missed March. Now let me explain to you too because you may not be sure on this, the difference between the SAT and the ACT. ACT is a test of what you have learned. It is very like your regents exams. So if you are a good student, you are likely to do very well on the ACT. Statistically, females do better on the ACT because it is a test more for what one learns. As opposed to the SAT, and I'm being real simplistic here, which is a test for what one is projected to be able to learn. There is much more test taking strategy that goes into the SAT. And that's why, to be honest, especially with guys, or some of these kids who are just great test takers and they're not great students. They say, you know, I'm not, homework is later. I'm not doing homework. But they're pretty good test takers because they have a mind that works that way. They're game oriented kind of people. And that's fine, that's a skill. But the ACT is more a test of what the student has learned. So good students tend to do better on the ACT. Okay, is that clear there? All right. Uh, any more questions on tests? Please, yeah. So you, I, did I understand you correctly? You recommend both ACT? And Absolutely. Okay. They, are, they are weapons in your arsenal. You have them. And, 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 and so give yourself the advantage of seeing which ones I want to use. See what you come up with, yeah. But, but you choose which test schools will look at. Yes, and if you do well in both, colleges love to have both. The more information you give colleges, the better off you are. So if the student does well on the ACT and the SAT, we send them both. And another point, because of the finances now, Remember, the higher your score, they care not whether it's ACT or SAT when they start giving out merit money. So if your score goes up 30, 31, 32 in the ACT, send it. I say it's dollar bills coming your way. Okay? Yeah. Any other questions? So if uh, some, which is another reason, he was supposed to take the March one, but in the middle of the test he physically got sick. So that, that cancels, so now we're taking the May. Good. So he's also set up for the AP exam in history. Yeah. So 
now you want to say he has to get up to the ACTs, or he should take He should the take the ACTs. Okay, now, do I go on College Board? No, you go right to my website, ACT, right there, www.act.org. Okay. The test in June is given in East Hampton, Riverhead, and West Hampton Beach. Okay? And if he's a very good student, you should do the June 6th subject test in U.S. and maybe math, depending on what he's in, and then you should do the June 13th ACT. So he's testing two Saturdays in a row, which I know is hard, and that's why I like April ACT, May SAT, June subject test. They say, see, I love you? Well, that's what I did. And then they'll say, oh, yeah, okay, fine. So you'll get off the wait list. So that's what I suggest you do. All right, get yourself folders. Then you've got to determine whether or not this is going to be a fit for you. So you plan ahead. How do you get to a tour? Go on to the website. They'll give them all the tour information you want. Is it too early to start as a sophomore? No. Window shopping, that's what you're doing. Go on a tour. Go for an info session. Keep notes, because guess why? After five, they're all going to look alike. They're all going to sound alike, which is worse. Once you go through about five info sessions, you say, I am never doing that again, because they all say the same thing. We all have a wonderful study abroad program. We all have wonderful professors. We all have great spirit. After five times, you've heard it. But you do have to do the tours. Prepare pretty well. Read some information about the school so you can ask an interesting question. Be comfortable. Arrive early. Number five, go out the information sheet on your inquiry card. There's some here about interviews, having good eye contact. When I do the fall session, I actually do an interview thing. Um, make recording your visits and follow up. If you do speak to anybody, get that person's name, get that person's card, and send them thank you for sending time with me. Most of them now will give you an email address. Get out of the car. You see in big black letters, get out of the car, breathe the air, walk around. I do the, you know, the white glove test. I do the cigarette butt test. I walk around and count cigarette butts because I can't stand it. If I see cigarette butts all over the place. Do whatever is important to you that you get the feel for the place. Um, then we have tips for parents and students on page five. Is that right? Okay, I would say this, each of the parents and the students should read this together. And number nine, students, remember your email address is your first impression. Have a nice email address for the colleges. And I suggest that you keep it only for the colleges. Because they're going to ask you, when you get on the site and you start requesting information, which you all should do if you're juniors, they want your email address. Make sure it's a nice email address. I've seen some that aren't so nice. Um, additional websites. There's test prep websites. There's career. If you have a pencil or a pen or something, you see where it says www.commonapp.org? It's so a third sort of set down. Everybody see that? CommonApp.org. If you're a parent of a junior or you are a junior, put yourself the note. Register here July 2nd, 09. Guess what? You can get the nitty gritty of your application done before you even start school. It's like name, rank, serial number. Fill everything in. That's what you want to do. You don't want all this hanging over your head when you start school in September, and after July 2nd, you can get on and register and set up your account on Common App. You say, what is Common App? This is Common App. It is used by almost 400 schools. <clears throat> Many of the schools are now joining this, even the public schools. All the SUNY schools are basically on Common App now. So you only have to do it once. You can make variety for however you want, but you do it once. That's what Common App is. And I will show you more about the activity list when I do the resume. I want you to add another website, U-C-A-N. You can Google U-CAN. <clears throat> it is a network 
that I use with all my students. Because you will get, as you get onto there, we'll pull up Bates, and you will see the number of kids that applied, the number of kids that were accepted. You will see the professor to student ratio. Here's how you become a wise consumer. If you see a teacher-student ratio that's up 18, 19 to 1, you don't want it. You don't want it. Because you're never going to be able to get in touch with the professor when you want to get in touch with the professor. You want to see a student-teacher ratio, well, I mean, part of it's 6 to 1 or 7 to 1, uh, up to 16, 17 to 1. That covers a wide range, but above that, up on. You're going to see a statistic that will say percentage of students returning for sophomore year. If you are a good student, you minimally want for something 80% return rate for sophomore year. Now, I'm going to throw it out to you. Suppose the return rate for sophomore year is 50%. What do you think is going on there? Huh? Not so much they didn't like it and they left. They liked it a little too much because they had too good a time. It's one of the things. Again, we all pick on Harvard. Harvard's return rate for sophomore year is 98%. So you want something that's 80% or above, or I say to you, it's not worth your money. Why are you going to send your kid to a school where enough of the kids are doing things they shouldn't be doing or whatever so that they're not even returning for sophomore year? Second thing, and, and you'll see it on this UCAN website on the first page, is the percentage of kids that graduate in five years. They're not even hardly giving four-year graduation rates anymore. And again, the better the student, you want to see something 80% or above. Now, there's some flexibility in there. A school like Drexel or a school like Northeastern, which has co-op programs, or RIT, you're going to see it less because the kids are taking five, six years. But then again, you look at a place like Arizona State, and you see uh, it's minimal the number of kids that get out of there in four years. And I, I'll tell you the reason why. Because they can't get into the classes they need to get their major requirements because there have been so many cutbacks in the funding. So do you want to set out with the understanding you're going to be paying for five years or not? So those are some things you really, really want to look at in becoming a wise consumer. And you can find that out on that sheet. All right? I'm quickly going on that, but I mean, I'm giving it to you to read. All right, the next page talks about being a wise consumer. And again, the first question, how many students the last year's freshman class? You go on an interview, you go on a tour, ask the question. You want to know question number three. Um, what academic services are offered without additional cost? Speaking of additional cost, that I think I have here. Oh, number seven, what are the hidden costs of attending the college? For example, parking fees, gym fees, lab fees. In some of the state systems that have been particularly hard hit this year, I am amazed at the fees that they are collecting for use of the athletic facilities. I'm not talking $20. I'm talking a good, good deal of money. So you want to ask that question outright. Um, and then whatever is important. If you're a kid who's involved in athletics here, you don't want to go to a place where, when you say, where's the gym, they say, gym who? You want to go to a place where you can find out the percentage of kids that are involved in intramural sports. All right? If you are uh, somebody who's very involved in theater, or music, but you're not necessarily going to be a theater or music major, you want to find out what are the opportunities for a non-major to participate in music or drama. All right, but I put all those questions there because I think it's important. The last one goes to what you said here. What percentage of your graduates contribute to the annual fundraising campaign? Why do you think that's important? Were they pleased as products. Yeah, that's what you want to look at. That's, that tells you